Ein herzliches Willkommen hier aus dem Schütterhof im Humboldt Forum in Berliner Schloss. Dieser großartige Raum, der auf uns alle wartet. Hier beginnen wir heute Abend. From the Humboldt Forum, counter questions. That's what we're going to be talking about here, and it's kicking off now. And it's basically looking at what we want to do here in the Humboldt Forum. We want to ask questions, but we also want to ask counter questions because questions often provoke counter questions. And this is how discussions get going. This is how debates come up. This is how we can share our different positions and views and create a lively place for lots of people from Berlin and further afield to talk about things, things that are important to us, things that are relevant to us, and things that are important generally. So that's what the Humboldt Forum wants to do to really put the forum back in Humboldt Forum. And this series is looking at writers and their books that inspire us to ask these counter questions. Often these are difficult questions, questions looking at questions like racism. We need to talk more about racism in our societies, about diversity. It's difficult sometimes, uncomfortable sometimes, and we're all driving identity policy and we and politics, and we all live in and with dilemmas. And these are the challenges that this series is talking about, talking with one another, getting new ideas, listening to one another, and ensuring that we connect our questions with counter questions. And today, we're going to start off with one of the biggest dilemmas of our age, racism, discrimination, diversity, identity politics, and we'll be asking the question, a serious question, of whether humor can help us to make such discussions more possible, to enter into conversations with one another, to be more lively, less cramped in our discussion about that. Is that possible with these very serious questions? I'm looking forward to the discussion, and I want to thank everyone who was involved in this forum, particularly Jan Linders, who's the head of our events area, and Thomas Böhm. And now I want to give the floor to Studio 3, to Geraldine de Bastion and Melinda Crane. Welcome. Thank you very much, Hartmut Dogalo, for your wonderful introduction. A wonderful evening to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. I want to welcome you, too, to a new series of events, Counter Questions, live from the Humboldt Forum in Berlin, Germany. I'm Geraldine de Bastian, and I'm Melinda Crane. And ladies and gentlemen, I also want to welcome you all very much. It's great that you're joining us in this premiere. Now, we just heard it from Hartmut Dogalo. With counter questions, we want to talk with guests who define our present about events and developments that define our age and question them, particularly those trends, those developments that are unsettling for us or confusing, ones that make us groan, but sometimes to laugh too. Exactly. And as Mr. Donnelly said, that's why the title of this evening's show is No Laughing Matter, because we want to talk about how humor can sometimes help us talk about issues like racism and identity politics. And with us, we have two guests who manage to create both distance and connection using humor. A very warm welcome to Amna Salim. She's a comedy author, screenwriter, broadcaster, and has published the books Who's Loving You? and It's Not About the Burqa. She's joining us now from Glasgow in Scotland. And welcome. Herzlich willkommen. Schön, dass du da bist. Düsseldorf zugeschaltet ist Dr. Joining us from Düsseldorf, we have Dr. Mitu Sanya, cultural studies researcher, journalist, and writer. She works in the area of pop culture, post colonialism, and feminism, and has written non fiction. Uh, non fiction book about rape and about the vulva. And this spring, she's published her first novel. It's called Identity. And it looks at attributed and chosen identities. Welcome to you, me too, Sanya. It's great that you can join us. 
Yeah, my yeah, my the Ladies the and head gentlemen, head we would have loved to invite you here live in person into the Humboldt Forum in Berlin. That's not possible, but we at least would like you to be part of our discussion this evening. And we've got a tool for your questions and comments, which you can call up. It's called VoxR, and it's www.voxr.com, stroke Humboldt Forum, one word. And here you can put your questions and your comments or comment on what other participants have said, and we will try to integrate your questions. And we've blended it in, and there's also a link if you're watching our live stream on YouTube or on our website, and you can note down this tool for your questions. And we're very much looking forward to your questions, ladies and gentlemen. Not just your questions, also brief comments. And you can also like questions of other participants. So that means if you like their question, we'll be asking those questions that have the most likes first to our guests. And now we want to begin with our discussion. And I'd like to start with you, Mitu. I hope you can hear me okay. I can now. I had a bit of a problem there for a minute. That's why I look so critical. It's not because of what we're talking about. Yeah, no, I did notice a critical, but it's really good that you can hear us now. So a very warm welcome again in case you missed that part. Now, in recent years, you have very much defined many of the debates about sexualized violence, in Germany particularly, and you have opened up new perspectives on it. Your latest book, Identity, is a novel that you have described as being a book that engages with the whole identity politics debate, but in a way that you have to laugh on every page. Now, why was it important to you to talk about this subject in a way that makes people laugh? Well, I didn't actually describe it myself, but I do agree with the description of it. Because I think if you're talking about difficult subjects and then you talk in a very heavy kind of voice, it quickly becomes pathetic. And then people quickly have that feel that they can't respond to it emotionally somehow. And at some point, I think it was a Russian who said, the heavier things are, the lighter the language has to be so that you can access people and make them connect with it. And many of the things that I've learned about racism, I've learned from British comedy. And that's why I'm so incredibly happy that Anna is here and that we can talk about that, because that is exactly what I find is missing here in the German-speaking world, you know? We're just starting talking about these issues, but the role of comedy in Germany is very, very different. It's much more marginalized than it is in Britain, where I think it's almost a self-definition of the Brits. We have the best sense of humor in Britain, and we can only take people seriously who make jokes and this sort of the citizenship test as well if you want to become a British citizen you have to almost crack a joke you know or know the comedy and understand it and appreciate it and I've got a question. Melinda said in the beginning that you're actually known for writing nonfiction. So we know you as a researcher, working on these issues that we've already talked about here, you know, and then identity politics is something that you're addressing in your book, but it's not a nonfiction, it's a novel. So what was it that made you decide to write a novel on this? Well, I think identities are always about stories. You know, you can't say something objective about identities, really. And I wanted to create a narrative that isn't just facts and figures and statistics or whatever, but that all of the stories are ones that are in flux. They can change. You know, if I'm talking about my identity, I couldn't say something final and draw a line under my identity. It's in flux, you know. And I wanted to have this sort of 
many different voices that you hear in any different identity with them sort of struggling one another, you know, and it's sort of like going through a transformation of meaning, you know, at the start of the 20th century, that was my personal private identity. And now we're talking about identity regarding groups, not a single person, you know, so even identity politics has changed in terms of what it is. And in this book, what I'm trying to do is sort of bridge the gap between the, well, the sort of ambiguity, ambiguity that it's very, very private, very, very individual identity. So even this affinity we have to groups isn't what other people in that group might say about their affi affinity to a group, you know, and that's why I thought that it's important that identities, identities are lies, but they're necessary lies. That's what I would say about that book. And it's not just the case that this new book of yours is, I mean, it's very funny, it's very entertaining. I hope it's okay to say that in many different interviews and different situations that I've experienced of you, you always seem to manage, even when it's a serious subject, to stay funny, to have a sense of humor and to light, lighten up the whole situation as well and make your audiences laugh. Is that something that for a long time you've developed as a strategy? You know, is it is humor a tool for you? Is it a strategy? Is it a defense mechanism? Well, certainly it's the case that humor means, yes, I'm criticizing something, but I'm not criticizing it, you know, from a, the, a high height or whatever. We're both laughing together about this problem, you know? And it's sort of inviting the audience to to laugh. And I, one of the things that impressed me most in that context, and, you know, there, there was an, Shaza Nerza, for example, you know, she comes onto her, onto the stage in hijab and she says, you know, I'm a comedian, at least I'm a pilot, I'm a comedian, that's what it says in my pilot license anyway, ha ha, you know what I mean? And you make a joke and then you're in the same boat. And I said that with an interview, you know, I, I laughed and I made these jokes and I thought, God, am I even allowed to make jokes like this? And it's like, yes, that's exactly what we should do. But without not taking it seriously, I'm taking it just as seriously. In your Amna, in deinem viel beachteten TEDx Talk, der ja online auf YouTube verfügbar ist, setzt du Humor mehr oder weniger genauso ein, also so wie Geraldine und Mito das beschreiben, als Werkzeug, als Strategie und mehr. Vielleicht auch als verbindendes Element, als Schutzmechanismus. Vielleicht ein bisschen von diesem TEDx Talk as a, as a für uns vorab als so eine Art Impromptu. Um, yes, I can, and I, I apologies that I am not speaking German. I am multilingual, but clearly I chose the um, worst languages. Um, but thank you for having me. <laughs> um, so I'll just do a, a short snippet. Feel free to stop me if I go on too long. Um, so I'd like to just say that I, what Mitu has just said actually just I agree with, with all of it. It makes so much sense to me because I myself feel that humor started out as a self-defense mechanism. Um, okay, so I believe in laughter. It's unifying, encourages empathy, and generally is good for your health. It's also a useful sword to wield in times of peril, such as any confrontations with racism or bigots. Laughing at bigots hits them where it hurts. They want my pain, my anger, and my tears, but they fear my laughter. And using humor to defeat racism is an underrated strength. Now, I'm not sure if you've noticed um, by now, but I'm a real life diverse person. I tick all the boxes. Um, but a lot of people seem to think this comes with a, a benefits package where everything is then suddenly handy to me and I can simply stroll my way to success. What they're actually thinking of is nepotism, which is, as we all know, somewhat unearned success. So I do find it bemusing that nepotism is acceptable and wildly prevalent, yet even the faint whisper of a diversity scheme or discussion about levelling the playing field for those without well-connected wealthy parents and fancy, school, fancy schools will have accusations of special, treat, um, special treatment flying. The thing about being a real-life diverse person in this day and age is it's kind of a double-edged sword. Things are getting better and more opportunities exist more than ever before, but they come with their own sort of cultural tax. For instance, sorry, the fire alarm is going off in my house. Oh, oh dear. 
<laughs> oh, no. That's part of being a real live uh, <laughs> person. Your talk is so hot. <laughs> Set off the fire alarm. <laughs> It, it hasn't been going off stuff. in the longest time and now it's going on. Okay, there's no fire. It is turned <laughs> off. I'm so sorry. As long as you'll say. Okay, safe. I will. <laughs> I didn't know. Okay, so sorry. Um, okay, so being a real life diverse person <laughs> in this day and age, it's a double edged sword. Things are getting better and more opportunities exist than ever before, but they come with their own sort of cultural tags. For instance, I wrote a sitcom for the BBC and I was invited on various TV and radio programs to promote it. And it was it was really, really exciting. I'd worked so long for this. But every time I went on um, these, these shows to discuss my work, 99% of the time I was only ever asked about my race and ethnicity and religion. And it was really crushing because I'd worked really hard to create something something nuanced, something funny, something interesting. And every single time someone spoke to me about it, I was reduced to tick boxes. Um, and it was, it, was, it was really frustrating because I noticed, I couldn't help but notice that my white peers were being asked about their work, their passion and their inspiration. And I was being asked about Sharia law, the hijab or ISIS as if I was auditioning to become a member or something. And these are things that I grew up talking about at home. So the fact that people wanted me to talk about them in public was, was rather strange. And also what was even more strange was that they assumed I was an oracle of all things ethnic minority. When I just wanted to talk about writers and directors and the TV shows I watched too much of and just like every other guest that they tend to have on. Whereas I was just watered down to whatever whatever kind of narrative they wanted to run that day about showing that they are in fact supportive of diverse people. But what ends up happening is the opposite. They only let me talk about diversity mm -hmm. without letting me actually grow as a person, which then means that I, I don't get to hone and nurture my skills because I end up talking about race and justifying my talent than actually discussing where that talent was in where it comes from and where it's going and what I what I hope to do. Um, I'll leave it there for now, but I, I can add more. Let, uh, let me ask you this, if I may, because what you're describing, yes, indeed, <laughs> what you're describing, much of it is amusing and much of it is very painful. And you have actually said elsewhere that you turned pain into humor to protect yourself, uh, that defense uh, mechanism that we were talking about. Can you say a little bit about how far back that goes? Is this something yeah. you developed even as a child? Yes, definitely. Um, it's something I thought about a lot as an adult where I've actually attempted to process it and just kind of understand it on like a, 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 a logistic level rather than an emotional one. Um, but so I am from Scotland. I grew up just outside Glasgow in this small town. My family was one of the few non-white families in our area. I was one of the very few um, non-white people at my school. So as you can imagine, kids are cruel. They're going to pick on anything that's easy for them. So it was a little bit difficult. But I would say that things, um, things I know changed for me, but I think this was like a mass cultural shift in the landscape where 9-11 happened. And all of a sudden I was the enemy. Like this this 14 year old Spice Girl wannabe was now the enemy. So I went from having some friends to eating lunch by myself in the bathroom. And it was one of the, the swiftest kind of were reversals that uh, I've ever experienced in my life. It was like, it was extremely, it was emotional whiplash, if you want to put it that way, because I didn't understand what had just happened. I didn't really understand why people thought people who looked like me was to blame. And I, I just, I was a kid, I just didn't get it. And it was so strange. My parents were so calm because they just, they knew what was about to happen. They knew what was coming and they, they didn't really have any words for us as in support. It was just like, this is going to happen and you're going to have to deal with it. Um, you cannot let yourself become a victim and that is harder said than done. But um, it was it was wise words because you, you do have to kind of stand up for yourself, but also you're still a child, so it's hard. Me too. We saw you nodding along as Amna was speaking just then. So I was wondering if you'd made similar experiences 
in your youth um, and, and whether you were relating to what Anna was just saying. Should I do this in German or in English now? Oh. Oh. Entschuldigung, auf Deutsch. I'm so sorry. Bitte. Do answer in German. I switched into the wrong language. Do forgive. No, no, really a lot of what she just said are things I can relate to because we don't get to choose the way we look. You know, we look the way we look. And there are lots of things where we can say, oh, I experienced that too because, you know, I had long hair. But it's like, yes, but you can, shut your, you can cut your hair short if you want to. And it's a hard choice it's a brutal choice, but you can belong if you want to. There are certain things that are really, really hard to change. You know, and I've tried to talk about this with lots of different friends, and it's just not something that you can translate into something else. And we looked at Shabbat Sandy, who talked about, you know, that her name in Persian is Chabara, and it, and it was always changed into shit attack in school. Teachers are so cruel. And she said lots of people who have a quote-unquote strange last name change their name, you know, and she had an Indian name and, he, you know, they changed their name to Jim or her cousin Mohammed changed his name to It Wasn't Me. And when I was looking at that with friends, it was the very first time that we could talk about that and say, oh, I'm suddenly understanding something. You know, I spent such a long time trying to explain something. And this joke worked on some deep level. So I'm still looking for the magic key. How can we talk about these things without setting up different camps right away, putting on different sides of a line in the sand, you know, or saying, you can't understand me, which isn't true. We've all had experiences of exclusion. So the question is, how can I get people with those experiences and grab them? you do that in different ways, of course, also in your work. Amna, in the beginning, I mentioned a couple of the fantastic things that you do, but one thing we haven't disclosed yet is your being BBC radio show, BBC Radio 4 show, Be Better Female. So um, I've, I've listened in and I'm already a big fan. I hope that BBC will let me listen to all the rest of the episodes here, not geolock them away from me. But um, the sort of growing up in a, in, a, in, a, yeah, in a family environment and then letting something new in and maybe something that looks different, as in the white British boyfriend that is brought home in the first episode of Better Female. I'm guessing that's also a way to sort of, yeah, introduce people to different experiences, perhaps, that are exemplary for some of the things that you've both experienced. But first, before we could go into the content of that, I'd love for you to explain, I learned that better female is a play on words, but I haven't learned yet what it means. So maybe you can explain that to me. Sure. Um, so beta female, so beta um, in Punjabi and I think also Urdu um, means child. So to be to be specific, it actually means more like son. But I think the kind of part of the Punjab that my family come from, we use it as unisex. So there is no beti, there's only um, beta in our house. Um, so that's what I grew up being called. And it's as simple as Oh, beta, can you make me a cup of tea? Or, oh, well done, beta. So it's just kind of that term of endearment. But then as you, um, I'm not sure if you know, but then in English, you have the alpha, beta type situation. So it was supposed to be like a double pun where she is certainly feeling um, insecure and less of herself. She's definitely not feeling like an alpha and she's behaving like a beta, but she's also a beta, which is a child to her parents. I hope I've explained that okay. And then um, female is um, uh, the XX chromosomes female. I, I don't think I have to explain that. So it's um, beta female. And um, yeah, I just, I, I still can't believe that I, I have a sitcom on the BBC, on the radio, and I can't believe what's grown since then. Now it's TV and um, dramas and, and comedy dramas and, and stuff. And it all came from me making jokes about my Pakistani culture, my Scottish culture, and how so often they would um, contrast, but they would also beautifully meld together and how much I enjoyed. I, when I grew up, people would insist that I had to choose one, which is impossible, you, you can't do that. So when I got older, I just, I, I, I stopped being so worried about what people thought and I fully embraced both sides of me unashamedly. 
And I guess the pilot and, and the, that sitcom is is what came out of it um, because it is, it is truly just uh, an amalgamation of um, my existence, I guess, and the existence of people like me who do experience dual heritage sometimes more. Um, and I, I feel... I feel sad that when I was younger, I was made to feel ashamed of it and embarrassed of it because there's nothing I can't, what even is there to be embarrassed about? So um, it's to know that it's on the BBC and to know that so many people loved it. And it wasn't just other Asian people. I had lots of people emailing me who would start off saying things like, um, oh, um, I was listening to something and your program came on next, but I was going to turn it off because, you know, it didn't sound like me. It sounded a bit to walk which is if it just not use it wasn't yours in the nicest way but they said oh and I accidentally left oh and it turns out that I loved it it was so relatable <laughs> and it was so funny and I was like yeah family is universal and um you know if I can relate to friends and Will and Grace and the Big Bang Theory then there's no reason you can't also find ways to relate to me and um, but it was a beautiful response and I appreciated their honesty but I it was something I knew all along and I just needed to be able to prove it, which I, which I think I did. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to go to Mitu, but you first and then I'll come back with a question. Ich habe ja tatsächlich ähm, Amna sozusagen mir gewünscht, weil yeah, ich Better really Female so geliebt habe. Yeah, I was really hoping it would be Amna on the show genau with me because I just so loved Better Female. Female. It's exactly this question: What are you really? Are you really Indian, or are you really German, or are you half Indian? You know, you're half Indian. That's what it was coming like. Which half of me? The right half or the left half? I mean, what? You know, we're double. It's like you say, we're just more, not half and half. We're more. And this thought that you have to decide. I was thought it was a really German idea because citizenship could, was inviolable. You couldn't even have two passports. It only just recently became possible. And then there were these huge political debates as to whether these people with two passports are real Germans or they just passport Germans, etc. And then sort of rediscovering all of these ideas and thoughts in your sitcom was so great for me. And also just the fact that people like us are like really important in in this. You know, I hear so many stories. You know, I read Wuthering Heights. I thought, oh, it's a story about me and my life, you know. I read it. And of course, you identify with everything in the world, you know, but it's just so wonderful. If it isn't so hard to identify, you don't have to go so far to identify. And that's what I was trying to do in my novel. I wanted to have, you know, this post-migrant experience is at the heart of my novel. I don't explain it. You know, I don't explain it to a white person. I don't say, hey, white person, this is our exotic reality. No, it's just our normal life and get with the program and you know I, all of the terms I sort of explain them but I don't justify the feelings or explain the feelings too much you know and Toni Morrison for example said that she said she writes for black readers everyone's allowed to read these books but she's not going to be explaining to a white audience and that's what's so great about this series that you know you're in this series and you have a feeling like you're allowed to sit down to dinner with your family and also feel a bit uncomfortable about the, some of the experience problems and the relationship problems, and it's great. We want to hear a little bit of your novel identity as well, but let me ask you something about that first of all. You know, you both talked about something now that I'd like to ask. Is it about making something more visible that's there, but is that, uh, that is often not seen? Namely, this community that you're talking about, that it's there, but for many, it's maybe not really visible, and you're making it visible? Is that a way we could describe it? You know, I have to say it differently, because I don't have a community in Germany, okay? Let me just say that, you know? Indians in Germany don't really exist, except that everyone thinks it's great. Oh, you know, in your, you know, in your, in your, you've got a quote in the back there, it says, Indians breathe so beautifully. And that was, you know, something that a good friend of mine said to me, oh, you're Indian. Oh, you, Indians breathe so well. And I was like, I thought I was going to, just, you know, asphyxiate because I just I couldn't even breathe. But on the other hand, 
It also means that in Germany, you know, this form of racism is one that I didn't experience in Germany because of being Indian, but because of my being non-white. That for sure. But if you think of Indian, you think, oh, these are these wise people. Why well, now think, you know, I would love to be able to justify, you know, I'd love to be able to distance myself from Modi's politics, but nobody asked me like that. All of my Muslim friends have to distance themselves from everything, whereas we have a pre-fascist government, and it's totally fine to say, you know, not in my name here. Sorry, Amna, you were nodding when I asked about making things visible. Maybe you want to also say a word about that. And also, we just heard from me too that we need to ask you because she doesn't really have a community here in Germany. Um, yeah, that thing that really interests me too told me the other day that the that the communities to, compared to Britain were just vastly different, um, and I wasn't aware. So I think I, I think my answer may be slightly different in that the um, the kind of Asian community, for instance, the one I'm um, kind of come from, is is um, visible. I would say, but I would say it's also visible for all the wrong reasons. Um, and it's very, very based on stereotypes and clinging to, the, to, we've not been able to evolve. So for instance, even in our Asian kind of British Asian comedy, the storylines are still from five to 10 years ago. We seem to be frozen in this time capsule as if we too haven't become modern and evolved. And I'll give a quick example where 10 years ago, it would have been normal um, and funny in a sitcom where the kind of Asian grandmother has plastic all over her sofa, all over her remote controls, and that would have been a funny gag. It's 10 years later, and however, that gag is still, like, so prevalent. And, like, I'm not saying you can't use it, but the, we need to move on. There are more things to talk about. We there's more kind of stereotypes to subvert. There are, there's the, it's also interesting because the generation that perhaps came here um, now have adult children who were born here, and those two cultures themselves are different. So you find that a lot of the kind of narratives come from are based on a generation that is older and isn't perhaps in the mix, as it were, pop culture as much, where, which is kind of the nexus I exist in. So it's um, interesting because we're visible, but we're still getting the very, as you know, the whole terrorist, arranged marriages, honor killings, the hijab. And if one more person tries to talk to me about the hijab, I might actually just like go insane because I have so <laughs> many opinions and I have so many ideas that I, I don't, it's not something that I spend my waking days thinking about, yet people think that I do. And I'm like, no, I am thinking more about the hot guy on the TV than <laughs> any random thing that you may think I should be aware of as a Muslim person. Um, so it's kind of this idea that we we aren't fully formed. And I, that is what we're, what we're trying to push forward is just... Mm -hmm. um, Normality, I don't know if that sounds strange, but please just treat us normally and um, instead of this kind of exoticism, this kind of, um, what is it, like um, cultural tourism, which is interesting, but sometimes we just want to eat a pagoda and not be asked a million questions about what's in the pagoda, if that makes sense. <laughs> I would love to eat a pagoda right now. Um, oh, you're so good. <laughs> So some of the subjects that Anna just talked about in terms of a sort of self-applied identity or self-sought identity as opposed to identity that is attributed to us are also in the book Identity. And now I'd like to ask you to read us a section from this just very briefly for our viewers who haven't yet read it and hopefully will soon. Identity begins with the fall from grace of 
have a renowned professor, Saraswati, who actually has a role model function, and it transpires that her ethnic minority background is completely invented, and she's basically created an identity for herself, which isn't the one that is her quote-unquote true identity. And her favorite student asks her about this, and the book starts with this her being outed, and it doesn't look at the question so much of you know, her race, but it more looks at the complexity of attributed and chosen identity. And I hope I've been able to explain that more or less. And I'd like to ask you to read a section from your book. Unfortunately, English listeners will have to wait until it is published, because we haven't got, been able to quickly interpret this. I've chosen a section that might not fit. So I'm just thinking that if this is OK for you, I'm going to read a completely different section of the book. Go right ahead. Because we were just talking about it right now. You know, this question of where do you come from? Where do you come from, really? A question that we're always asked. And by the way, just let me say one more thing to Amna, who just talked about the question about hijab. I'm constantly asked about hijab. Germans are constantly saying, oh, I think it's so great that you don't wear hijab. And it's just like, uh, you know, the fact that we've got, we, we're ethnicizing religion here, or what? What is this about? You know, okay, the second largest Muslim community in the world after Indonesia, you know, always think Pakistan and other countries too, but no, no, India. But we're trying at the moment to get rid of all of the Muslims in India. Don't even get me started on that one. Uh, so it starts with the question of where do you come from that is asked in the taxi. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to say about the first and the second generation that you were just saying here, that was another key issue in my book as well, because the first generation and the second generation, but it's also being third generation. And for Nivedita in my book, she's second generation in the sense that her father came from India to Germany, but he's also, she's also third generation because the family of her mother comes from Poland, so her grandmother came to Germany from Poland. And these are different histories. They affect you in different ways. At least the taxi driver, as taxi drivers always do, ask her, where do you come from, really? And this won't be translated, I'm afraid. Und wo kommt die Mama her? Aus Polen, aus Polen, aus Polen. Das Taxi fuhr durch die Unterführung Hüttenstraße und sie waren in Oberbilk und damit zu Hause. Und der Papa? Aus Indien, kapitulierte Nivedita. Das ist ja eine originelle Mischung. Sie bezweifelte, dass das bei der Entscheidung ihrer Eltern für ein Kind eine Rolle gespielt hatte. Wir würden gerne einmal möglichst originell mischen. Außerdem war im Ruhrgebiet die Mehrheit der Bevölkerung sowieso in irgendeiner Generation polnisch. Birgit, das ist Nivitas Mutter, war eine geborene Schimanski. Das hatte Nividita als Kind immer für eine besondere Ironie gehalten, da Birgit Annan dem berühmten Horst Schimanski so überhaupt nicht ähnelte. Doch mit zunehmendem Alter, also seit ihrem ersten Freund, war ihr klar geworden, dass der himmelblauäugige Tatortpolizist Schimanski mit seinen weichen Trenchcoats und den harten Sprüchen genau die Sorte Mann war, die Birgit attraktiv fand. Rauchend wie Simon, das ist Nivitas Freund, und sauchen, saufend, nicht wirklich wie Simon, und deutsch wie Simon. Und Nivedita begann zu rätseln, wie Birgit und Jagdish Anand jemals zusammengekommen waren. Doch für Birgit war Tatort Schimanski nicht deutsch. Ich kann mich noch genau erinnern, wie ich ihn das erste Mal im Fernsehen gesehen habe. Das war 1979, nein, 81. Für Birgit war genau eine relative Angabe. Ein polnischer Kommissar. Du kannst dir gar nicht vorstellen, welche Vorurteile es damals gegen Polen gab. Wie viele Polen braucht man, um eine Glühbirne auszuwechseln? Die Glühbirne wird geklaut. Dass ein Pole Kriminalhauptkommissar sein konnte und nicht krimineller, das war... Ach, wir haben echten Rassismus erlebt. Es ist so toll, dass es so etwas heute nicht mehr gibt. Jedes Mal, wenn Birgit diese Geschichte wiederholte, und sie wiederholte sie ständig, <lacht> überlegt Nevidita, ob sie ihrer Mutter an die Gurgel gehen sollte. Alternativ sagte ja auch ihr Vater gerne, dass er noch echten Rassismus erlebt hatte. Doch wenigstens leugnete er nicht, dass es heute noch Rassismus gab. Nur hielt er ihn für minderwertigen Rassismus, so wie er auf das Wort Mikroaggressionen in der Regel mit großen Aggressionen <lacht> reagierte. Was ist dein Problem mit deiner Mitbewohnerin Lotte? Lotte trägt Bindi, hä? Was soll das Problem sein? Daran verdient ein indischer Bindi-Hersteller und ein indischer Bindi-Exporteur. Schon mal darüber nachgedacht, hä? 
Wir hatten noch Angst, auf der Straße zusammengeschlagen zu werden. Damals gab es richtigen Rassismus, nicht so einen Sonnenschein-Rassismus wie heute. Nevidita schaute ihn an und dachte an all die Dinge, für die er keine Sprache hatte und hatte keine Sprache, sie ihm zu erklären. Also versuchte sie, sie ihrer Cousine Preeti zu erklären, als sie in der Uni auf die Ankunft von Sharaswati warteten, die wie üblich zu spät zu ihrem eigenen Seminar erschien. Ich wünschte, ich wäre als indisches Mädchen in England aufgewachsen. Dort gibt es wenigstens eine Community und kulturelles Wissen über uns. Während hier, sie brach ab, als Preeti ihren Ringordner auf den Tisch knallte. You Germans mit eurem kuscheligen kleinen Rassismus. You have no idea about racism before du nach Fascho England kommst. Rate mal, warum ich da weg bin. Germanistan ist ein Puppenhaus dagegen. Was ist mit dem NSU und mit Uri Yallo, wandte Nividita, die in mit Schirmscham und Melone-Verehrung für England aufgewachsen war, vorsichtig ein. Like I said, ein Puppenhaus gegen das, was wir jeden Tag erdulden müssen, sagte Preeti und sah dabei weder besonders geduldig noch besonders beschädigt aus. Und auch nicht so, als wüsste sie, wer Uri Yallo und der NSU waren. Das war mein generischer englischer Akzent. Entschuldigung. So, uh, forgive me for my generic attempt at a British accent there. Thank you very, very much. Du And, musst auf jeder Seite lachen. Sorry. Yeah. That, that will absolutely be resonating with Amna, the beginning of that, because Amna, in fact, you have in your TED Talk a very similar part. It begins with saying your accent doesn't match your face. That's the, uh, the Scottish-Pakistani mix uh, that is so unusual uh, that we just heard uh, from Me Too about the Indian-Polish mix, uh, also original. Um, so, so you say in the TED Talk, your accent doesn't match your face. Um, and in fact, a lot of your work does deal with that question. Who is in a position to define identity? And, um, you know, can you defi define the identity of someone else? And in this uh, context, you do a wonderful routine um, that's also like the taxi ride. And in fact, that dialogue will be very familiar to any of us who are a little bit incongruous in the places where we live, which would even include, uh, when I get into a taxi, they immediately recognize that my accent in German is not uh, properly German. So if you would, please do that dialogue for us. Yes, of course. Um It's funny how how relatable it is in um, Me Too is in Germany, and I, I'm here and we've had this somewhat experience. Um, but sure, so as you said, many people will be familiar with the whole but where are you really from thing. But for those unfamiliar, this is usually how it goes. A random and complete stranger will say to me, nice accent, where are you from? And I'll say, Scotland. And then they say, okay, but where are you really from? And I'll say, Glasgow. And they'll be, no, 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 I mean, where are you really, really from? So then I get more specific and I tell them I'm from a small town called Bells Hill, which I usually don't like to admit because if you've been there, you know why I don't really like to admit it. But then, which just annoys them further. And finally, exasperated, they say, no, where are your parents from? And then I'll say, my dad is from Pakistan and I can, I can just see their face. I can almost see their brain. And it's as if suddenly... I am a jigsaw piece that's just been put together or as if they've just cracked the Da Vinci code and now um, they understand <laughs> me as a person. And I, it's funny because I can see it happening. It doesn't obviously happen all the time, but the telltale signs are there. And I was, I was actually um, perhaps talking to me too about it where I now bring it up within five minutes if I if sometimes, because if I have something more interesting to talk about, I don't want to spend 20 minutes talking about why my accent sounds like this, when my face looks like this, but my dad is from here and my granddad is from here and I live here. It's exhausting. And I and but the funny thing is if I say to someone, especially like um if I'm in England and I'm speaking to a white British person and I say, But where are you really from? They act as if I'm crazy. And I'm just like See, you don't want to give me your DNA, your lineage, your blood type, just five minutes while meeting me. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting experience, but it's also a great icebreaker. I have to say, I don't mind curiosity whatsoever. I, I definitely understand, but I feel like if that's what you're dying to know within five minutes of even just 
having general conversation, it, it, it's very frustrating because this might be the first time you've asked someone this question, but this is the millionth time I will be answering this question and um, you will work harder for me to know how to like you. So yeah, take it easy on yourself. Yeah, yeah, I often wonder and what it is with German society because it seems to be everybody's favorite question here. But I, uh, I was thinking as you were saying like, oh, somebody who's not experienced this themselves will look at you like a crazy person. And if this is one of these cases where you have to be part of the club to get the joke, <laughs> just like you have to be part of the club to get the frustration about it, but you also have to be part of the club to find it funny. Do you think that's true? Yes, I feel like people can like um, understand with context, but if you've had it happen to you, it hits you on a whole different level. And that's why you'll get people nodding and kind of smiling to be like, yes, yes, that's exactly it. Whereas other people might be like, oh God, I do that. I do that all the time. And I'm not trying to shame anyone. It is a natural curiosity, but it is also, it, it gets a bit tedious. Me too, in, in deine Lesung no, und eigentlich too, auch in, in, uh, in reading the section you read from your book just now and in the dialogue that Amna's just given, her, given us as well. It's about the fact that people are sort of attributing an identity to other people from outside. They just want to categorize people. So that's the one side of it, and that's one that you've explained in your novel well. But there's the other side as well that you talk about your main protagonist who selects an identity for herself, and her original identity is sort of hidden as a result and changed. So do you condemn Saraswati for the fact that she's doing that? That, that she is denying her original identity? And maybe a more principal question as well, to what extent is, are you, is it okay to sort of treat identity as fluid? That's really interesting because I'm always asked that. You know, my book is being translated into English. I found an American publishing house and they also, oh, it's really radical because at the end of the book, you don't say whether it was right or wrong with Saraswati. It's like you've written a whole book about the fact that it's about ambivalence, that there's so many aspects there that are really dubious. You know, this is a white professor who pretends to be a POC and her students are learning learning from a white woman what real racism is. And that's essentially the story of my life in, the, in a sense. It's one of the many stories of colonialism. Who explains to you what you're allowed to feel and experience, how you're allowed to experience the world and see the world? You know, in this question of where do you really come from? You know, if I give a response to that question, they'll keep answering until they get the question that is right for them. It's not enough if it's the question that's right for me. Or sometimes, you know, I've interpreted it wrong. You know, they want to hear that I'm Indian. And then they say, no, no, whatever you do, you're doing it wrong. You know, whatever answers, it's just like they'll always say to you, you know, they get to decide who you are. And that is the key issue of Nevita's life as well, that she didn't have the right to talk about this. And there's this seminar, and she goes into Saraswati's seminar, and seminar gives her a certificate, justification. You get to choose your identity. And when I was writing this book, it was the same thing, that I had the sense, I say something, and I was really afraid that somebody was going to touch me on my shoulder and say, you can't write a book like that. And then Anna says, no, 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 you're not Indian enough. Maybe she would say that because you've got a white mother, so you're not really Indian. And that was really interesting that I got so many letters and so many emails afterwards from people who said they share exactly this feeling. You know, am I allowed to define myself? Or, for example, there was a talk show at some point with other writers of color, with Sharon Dodua Otu and others as well, and that we said we, and it was so sexy to say we, we, writers of color, is something that I've, I've just never been able to say we. 
you know, it's like, no, no, but you don't really belong. But at the same time, as soon as you say we, you're saying that there's a you, you over there, and we are here. So that's wrong too, in a sense, you know, and the students, for example, who are really shocked at what the, this professor is doing, Saraswati, that, you know, you don't get to decide, but in a sense, that's a form of essentialism that's also wrong. And, but in the political circumstances in which we live, it makes a lot of sense on the one hand. You know, Saraswati says sex is for, is for everyone, why isn't race for everyone? And race is far more constructed in a sense than sex, but in the world in which we live, it's a problem because we have to change the world. We can't say we're going to start with us. And so it's about being between all of these different things. And at the end of this, Navadita says, I think it's wrong what Saraswati did, but if she hadn't done it, so much in my life would not have happened that was would have happened that is so important and that both things can be true so there are so few poc professors that remains the case at universities and if there were more maybe it wouldn't be as bad what saraswati did I have to say, I had to go away and think about it. You know, when I read that passage in your book and I read others, then there's this ambivalence, just as you described it. Who gets to decide who I am? And I guess if I try to make sense of it for myself, it's about we don't live in a fair society. We don't live in a society where people have equal access to things and equal opportunity, if it were the case. That, you know, how many POC actors get roles or get, you know, CEO positions in companies or whatever. And if they did, then it would be a different dialogue that we'd be having here as to when you can select what what identity for yourself, but people can't just not be a person of color. You can't just decide to cut your hair like you were saying. You can't, I mean, you can decide to cut your hair, but you can't just change it. And so what I understood from your texts and from what you were saying is that it's not okay because it's just not fair. Would you say that as well? Well, yes and no. I mean, my book is premiering as a play, and the problem is that the theater troops in Germany are all white, so they can't really fill the roles, you know, and we're sort of pretending with the audience, of course, we're pretending, but you need a good reason. You can have everyone play any role, but if you say we haven't got any brown actors, then that's not a very good reason. So that means that we have to change the structures. But what does that mean for individual people? Do we have to wait until the end of the revolution for the others to get a chance? No. So it gives you this sort of space, and I think it's really important. But at the same time, there are always personal histories. So with Sharswati, there's a reason why she did it. She didn't just do it for the fun of it. There's a reason. But I think the truth is that we're all crossing over people's boundaries. I've talked a lot about cultural appropriation, that that's impacted on my life, because I've always felt that the attribution was wrong, that I felt it on my body, that, you know, they almost silenced me as an author, that I always wrote more autobiographically because everybody was looking at it and saying, you know, they can, they can feel that I'm appropriating something. But with white people, it's always invisible when they do that. And so the debate about cultural appropriation is a really valuable one, but an individual case of it is wrong, of course. You know, you don't have to become a frog to carry out research about frogs. Um, can I add something, if that's okay? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, excellent. So um, what me to say is makes so much sense that things aren't so, um, forgive the pun, black and white. So <laughs> it is um, it is tricky. But I would say that these things, when you, when you are taking on a, a persona or changing an identity um, to be one of a minority, that is... Um, it's hard because we have Rachel Dazel, who um, is, is just world famous for what she did. But I think something that's kind of mixed things up is that America heavily influences the global, it has a nearly global narrative around race, 
which I personally, I find very interesting, but also it isn't always helpful is because their history is fractured and unique to them, especially as they're such a young country and they have um, very specific things that they are still reeling from and having to um, pay attention to. And sometimes uh, I find that the world in general picks and chooses the parts that they want um, they want to apply to themselves, but the context is then is then lost. So, for instance, what Rachel Dazel did was, in my opinion, it was just wrong. There was no real, there was no real reason, um, there was no justification because um, America is in such a sensitive state where um, black people have been struggling and fighting for their rights for such a long time. For someone who has never faced that particular type of fear and racism and kind of insecurity growing up and then to just suddenly almost don the costume um, without the lived experience for me is a little bit difficult because if we were to talk about myself I know that my whole life changed after 9-11 but if someone for instance now was to turn around to me a white friend who said oh you know I think I'm going to be more Asian now I, I would be normally confused but it's not that I'm saying it has to come with pain, but they don't understand these, these very integral things that have happened have shaped me and the Asian community as people, whether we kind of know it subconsciously or conscious, um, not so much. Um, and it is almost like, I'm going to take all the fun parts and you can keep all the crap parts because that's it's so easy for them to shed it. So for instance, if they if they were in trouble, then they just have to say that Rachel Dizelle is um, being a black woman, she just has to take her hairstyle out, the fake tan off, put on an acceptable outfit, and suddenly she's a white woman again, and she has all the privilege of that. You can, uh, there is no way a black woman would ever, ever have the luxury of doing that. And that for me is the, the concrete difference of be pretending to be some a different race and just the life of someone who is that race, if that makes any sense. Very much, Absolutely. Amna. Yeah, go ahead. It is, it is so funny because um, right, Rachel, she was up. Um, sorry, I've got to speak German. <laughs> this is really difficult. Um, Rachel Dolezal was naturally. So Rachel Dolezal was, of course, the inspiration for exactly this story. You know, I saw that experience at the whole debate online. I followed it as well on the internet, and I thought, oh yeah, finally, part of this conflict is out in the world, and I can talk about it. I don't have to do anything autobiographical. Of course, the book is still read as an autobiographical book, no matter what I write about. You know, if you're brown, oh, you're writing about your story. End of, end of story, you know. And so I consciously decided that this shouldn't be a professor who prefers to be black but POC because that will be dealt with very differently in Germany than in the US. So a lot of people here who are very clearly POC are read as white in the US. And so that just shows that it's about, it's a social position. It's nothing to do with the way you actually look. It's not about Color is about exactly. a, racial, a race construct, so yeah. Leute, and that's the thing. If it ends up being seen through an American lens, however, then the whole thing will be bastardized because they have a specific language to talk about it. And that is always the kind of the fear when you when you are doing something is that it makes sense in your context, in your country, with your culture, and then all of a sudden it hits the mainstream and... Um, as you know, the internet is a fun place where people have lots of opinions. Um, so it can suddenly turn into something it wasn't in the first place. So that's when I when I learned that your book was actually um, a person of color who wasn't black, I was very intrigued because that is a different story that has different context, that has different history. Um, also, it's in Germany and um, the European kind of colonialism is something that's not as explored in the same way as we have been seeing it in the US. So um, it's really exciting that you've done it and put on a different spin on it. And I'm really, I have to say, I'm very glad that you didn't actually make it a black woman and just transplant it because mm -hmm. one, it wouldn't work and two, it just wouldn't be as compelling a story for the story that you are trying, that you are telling because they are not the same. 
and you obviously know that. So sorry, I'm just explaining your book to you now. Like, um, <laughs> please, <instead> of... <laughs> you can explain it so much better than I can. And it is really interesting also about colonialism because German colonialism, we, we, we basically we think we didn't have colonialism. Me too. Oh. Das, das ist bestimmt etwas, was, was du sehr gerne no, in Deutsch sagen. Is certainly yeah, something sure. you'd rather <laughs> say in German, wouldn't you, for our German-speaking <laughs> audience? Genau, and also mir war es halt auch yeah, wichtig, yeah. über deutschen Kolonialismus I mean, it was really important to me to talk about German colonialism, because in, in Germany, so the narrative is, we didn't have colonialism. If we did, it was very brief, but really we didn't have any. And in the context of the Humboldt Forum, that's really a difficult issue. You know, it's one where where there's been a lot of art stolen from the colonies and exhibited here, you know, even people stolen, kidnapped and, and exhibited here and white Germans could then look at them. So it's the right place to talk about it. But at the same point, we're talking in the Humboldt Forum. And so this history is there. Yeah, so this professor for post-colonial studies, yes, that's all there. But Germany also has a colonial past. For example, around the Ottoman Empire, Germany also has a colonialist history or pre-colonialist history in Poland, or most of the crimes committed in the Holocaust in the Shoah were committed in Poland. So why are we just looking at the Indian past and not with your Polish past, which is, has a lot to do with the fact that when people ask me where I come from, they're not interested in my Polish history, they're interested in what I look like. Okay, can I just briefly bring us back to humor, because this evening we're talking about it being no laughing matter. And we've got a question from our audience. But before we get to that, there's one question that I really want to ask. And it goes back to these mixtures that you've both described so wonderfully. You know, Indian, Polish, and Scottish Pakistani. And the question is whether or not in a, a mixture of this kind, it's a particularly good breeding ground for humor, the sort of friction between cultures that you have inherently. Is that something that's particularly fruitful for humor? Just very briefly from, from each one of you, and then we'll go back. Um, sure, I, I feel almost spoiled because not only do I have several languages to make jokes in, um, I also have various parts of my two cultures to dip in and out of to make funny jokes and stories and plot lines. So I, I very rarely run out of um, content because I do come from two very full and vibrant cultures. And um, so sometimes I feel like I'm almost cheating because I have so much color around me, but due to the fact that I just, I can just very easily dip in and out of these things, the, the, these pieces that make me me. Um, and honestly, I will never get tired of bragging about the fact that I can tell jokes in like two or three languages and they still make sense. So um, yeah, it, it, when I was younger, it was supposed to be a bad thing that I had this kind of upbringing and heritage and background. And, I, I still can't believe I let people I let people make me think that it was that, that I believed it. It feels really silly now because now, um, as Shakespeare says, like my cup runneth over. Um, I don't know how you translate that in German, sorry. And um, it's yeah, it's good. It's don't get me wrong. There's so much hard about it, so much that's tricky and difficult. But I feel very um, grateful, and I'm so glad that they're so different um, in many ways, but they're also so similar in different ways because. It allows me to make connections, find patterns, but also kind of lightly educate people through jokes and like a Trojan horse. So, um, yeah, I I think I answered the question. I may have just answered a different question. But no, I answered you absolutely <laughs> answered the question. Me too. Me too. It's great that you mentioned Shakespeare because my favorite conspiracy theory is that Shakespeare isn't William of Stratford on Avon, but a black woman, Emilia Bassano. In my book, I write about that as well. And Emilia Bassarolani was one of the first published writers. And, you know, researchers are really assuming that she actually was Shakespeare. I love it. That's great. That would be just perfect. 
if that's true. But anyway, regarding the question of whether it enriches me, I have to say in Germany for a very long time, the thought of mixture was one as if mixtures were less stable. So a mixture is less. And one of the real discoveries in writing this book, I thought it was a book about race and racism. And that's really interesting too, that I, I can't use German words. In German, we use the word race. We don't say Rasse in German because that suggests that there really are races of human beings in German, whereas the word race in English is a sociological construct. Not that everybody's got that yet, but there we are. And But, you know, POC is an English word as well. You know, we use it in the German language. We don't have language in German. You know, for a long time we would say there are no races, so there can't be racism. End of story. And when I was writing this book, I realized that the real issue was being mixed race. But what does that mean? And again, I'm using the English in my German. And, you know, there's just no language for it, you know, that these connections were actually forbidden in Germany, too. There were actually laws against it, not just under the Nazis against racial mixing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Und yeah, exactly, das exactly. But, you know, that, uh, like, you know, the doctors warned my mother and said that, you know, these children, these mixed children all have psychological problems. They lead to, you know, they get to depression. And, you know, you know this, this, like, for example, this Bernd Hellinger, who had family constellations, who said mixed families, you can't do a constellation, so forget it. And it wasn't until I wrote this book that I really saw that this was a source of inspiration. My drama in my life is I didn't grow up bilingual. Now my children have to suddenly grow up and, you know, my partner is British and they were like, oh, come on, let's just speak in the normal language. He's like, no, you have to speak English at home. So they're bearing the brunt of it. I didn't learn Bengali. My father comes from Bengali, uh, Bangladesh. I didn't grow up German-Polish either because then it was like, no, children have to learn one language, otherwise they won't learn any language properly. Thankfully, things are different now, you think. But teachers are constantly complaining in, for example, Berlin's Neukölln district and saying, these children don't speak German at home. Yeah, no, because they're growing up bilingually or even trilingually. And so if it's, they're not learning the right questions, white languages, then it's considered a deficit. And this huge wealth there, it's like it's behind a, behind a wall of glass and opening it is a real challenge for me. And that was something I did in this book as well to say there's so much potential there. And Evita doesn't want to just talk about racism because it's a strain. She also wants to enjoy race like sex and gender can be enjoyed. And when she talks about that, people are like, uh, no, 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 just stop right there. You know, and that's something I'm looking at in my book as well, that it's actually something that's wonderful. It's about belonging. Oh, it would be lovely to just to talk, continue to talk to you all on our own, but we did say we would let people in the audience write questions, so here's you that we received by our audience, which is where you really, really from, no, sorry, that was a terrible joke. <laughs> <laughs> Please forgive. I'm going to merge the top two voted questions into one. Um, where would you differentiate between a good and a bad joke when it comes to the topic of racism? And what happens when you laugh at the wrong place? So um, I can, if Amita doesn't mind, I can take the kind of the good and bad joke thing. I think just inherently, if you are laughing with someone, that is always the kind of tell. If you're laughing with someone and not laughing at someone because of a, a difference. So for instance, let's just put it personal. If you are laughing at me because you think being Pakistani is a derogatory um, kind of ethnicity and you think that I'm beneath you and you're laughing at a joke that is, is pointing that out, then I feel like that is not a very nice thing to laugh at. Um, but if you're laughing because I am making fun of my Pakistani heritage, like, if, for instance, my mom is forever telling me to maybe go on a diet, but then if I don't eat her food, she gets very, very upset. So I can't win, and I also can't lose those five pounds, so it's very difficult. So it is that kind of, it, there is a difference, and it really does come down to, are you laughing at this person's um, humanity, their differences in a negative, derogatory way? Or are you laughing because part of you can empathize or part of you is curious or part of you is interested or 
or the remain the due of, of something. Um, so yeah, there, I feel like people are always saying, oh, we can't laugh at anything anymore. And it's like, well, why would you want to laugh at someone who's disabled and making fun of them because their hand twitches or something like that? I think those are the questions that we really need to be asking. What is What exactly is funny about that? Um, and there's there's always the matter of not necessarily punching up as this is becoming a bit of a redundant phrase, but also you don't have to be so kind of sweet and kind all the time. You can still be sassy and edgy and whatnot, but your joke should at least be funny and at least have some wit about it and have some humor rather than otherwise it's it's no more interesting than a fart joke. And everyone loves a fart joke, but do you really want to live in a world with just fart jokes? <laughs> like, sorry to be so, but I think that is the difference for me. If you're laughing at someone negatively because you feel that they are beneath you, then you may want to ask yourself some questions. However, if you're laughing because it's inappropriate, but funny because you're seeing it via their, this person's kind of pit, this person and you're seeing them as a person then I, I feel like like go laugh away laugh please do um and also if you're laughing at something that is perhaps you shouldn't be just do it quietly it's fine everyone everyone's guilty of something aren't they no one's perfect yeah yeah absolutely me too would you like to add yeah, it's so schön, weil es yeah, it's so great, because I, I know it from my youth as well, that young people would say, you don't have a sense of humor. If I didn't want to laugh at offensive jokes, but it's like, hey, maybe the joke isn't a funny one. You know, but, and there are, there are jokes that sound really brutal. Like in the early 90s, I lived with a woman who actually came into my book as Barbara. And one of the jokes that Barbara made, she always made, she always used to say to me, this is our Asian cleaning lady. And, you know, at a time it was really funny because that was in the 90s when everyone's like, I don't see color. But, you know, the person I was in a relationship with them would seriously say, oh, did you order her from a catalog? Is she a male order bride? It's like, great, okay. And so the fact that she said it, it was just such a relief. So you really could laugh about it and talk about it somehow. Because because before that, it was a trench. It was over there. You could see it, but there was no way to talk about it. And she created a bridge over the trench. Um, we're, we're just conferring about audience questions. Um, I can't actually read it. No, there's another question here that we got from the audience. Is, are we, haven't we laughed about it enough now? Couldn't we talk about it seriously for once? So I hope I haven't, don't have to answer that question ourselves because I can't see our two guests. They've suddenly gone. Oh, they're there. They're back. Phew, I couldn't see them for a minute. So okay. one of you can answer. Um, the thing is, is like what people don't realize, or perhaps they do, is that my whole life it's been serious. When when I was getting beat up because I was brown, it was serious. When I couldn't um, be promoted because the company that I worked for claimed that they supported diversity, but really just didn't care, that was serious. When 9-11 happened and my whole world changed, that was serious. When when my when a boyfriend's mother says like something like oh you didn't tell me she was the wrong color that was serious so i guess like please forgive me for for wanting to lighten this this pain that i've carried that we've a lot of us have carried from like almost birth in in in, in using it in a humorous way because it feeds me it helps me and it, it helps me communicate because I have no desire to be sad all the time. I have no desire to be angry all the time. I have no desire to be fighting the world all the time. So this humor may seem as if it might be lightening the conversation and such, but this is, I will never be more serious because this is the biggest, most impactful way for me to, um, to affect change, for me to make people listen because no, when you're trying to speak to someone seriously, they tend to think that you're preaching. And when someone thinks that you're preaching to them, they shut down. They hear nothing more that you're saying, even if it's all sensible. So it's it's a learned tool of communication where you know where you know when you will be listened to and when you won't. 
um, and it becomes second nature. It's not something that I imagine any of us were like, when I grew up, I'm going to have an awkward personality and a debilitating sense of humor. It's more just like that is how you're molded by your experiences and talking about things that are painful it helps actually power through because there are so many horrible memories attached to when we talk about race and racism and so many things that we've swallowed from people who mean well but still manage to hurt your feelings but you don't say anything because you know they're trying so if you were to hang on and take in every single time that happens and trust me it happens a lot there is going to be no lightness in your life there's going to be no funny there's no humor so it really has to come within. And that is the, my, personally, and I, I think I'd be interesting to know if me to feel similarly, similarly, but I need the humor in order for things to change. And I need the humor mm-hmm. to be heard and I need it to make me feel safe and, and heard and understood. And I don't know if that's way too sentimental, but um, that is just what I've, I've personally found. Me too. You know, I absolutely, absolutely agree with all of this. And apart from the fact in German literature, there really isn't much sense of humor here. You know, we do not have that problem. We just don't in Germany here. And I think that the two things aren't a contradiction. You know, I looked at the Amazon ratings for my book at some point, and I think it was number one in three different categories, namely humorous literature, political literature, and homosexual eroticism. What? <laughs> what? There's nothing like that in my book. But yeah, homosexual erotic, number one. That's me. Great. You know, I took a screenshot of that because it's like I was proud. And then it's also the case, you know, the way we laugh can generate a lot of empathy. You know, it's a bit like what Anna said in the very beginning. You know, the first time that my world changed was when I read Goodness Gracious Me, this British comic series. It was on the BBC on the radio. And that they, they just, you know, turned things around. You know, they had this going for English. That was the most important sketch that they had there. I think that you had, you had Indian people going to eat Indish, and they said, what's the blandest thing in the menu? You know, what is it with the least spice? And, and when you start turning this around, you suddenly realize just how absurd they are. And, you know, I read a lot lot of research and, you know, academic essays about goodness gracious me, because it was just so interesting. And it was like how British Asian people are perceived, how they are seen, if they have a sense of humor, and if, if you can laugh with them, and if we see the world from their eyes, then we can feel for them as well. We can understand their feelings and empathize more. And that was incredibly important for me. And for me, this was a sort of vehicle to think about my world that, of course, has nothing to do with that in a way, but to be able to talk about it. It was close to any experience in my life than all of the German novels I've read together. So now, looking at the time that we've got left, we want to try to achieve a kind of outlook or try and get you towards to think about an outlook. Like in another interview of yours, Mitu, I remember you saying that for you, being a writer when you were a kid was just as far away as becoming an astronaut. Because you just didn't have role models, you just didn't have role models, you didn't have examples of what you could be. You know, before we were talking about the perspective of, you know, your parents. We heard about that for a second. And I'd be interested in knowing what has changed since then. Can you see now that people have other role models? The children nowadays, for example, are things that have changed, that we can look to the future differently, and that there are new courses that we have set. Let me say that I'm very, very happy that we're even having these talks like this evening, that we say these are important, relevant issues. First of all, I'm really happy about the fact that my novel is 
being read and that people are interested in it, but it also shows where we are as a society. You know, 25 years ago, I started writing, when I started writing this novel, I thought about it, it was just about this story of these two cousins. They were friends then. And my agent, who's my agent then as well, she suggested to Publishing House, and she, they said, oh, we've got an Indian author already in the program. I thought you meant, you know, what they meant was we have one Indian writer in Germany, period, in all publishing houses, not even in this publishing house. So, yeah, things have changed for the very first time. It's not just one book of a person of color visibly from an ethnic minority, but that you can tell the whole story, that you can say this is one perspective, but there are other POC perspectives, and they can even communicate with one another. You know that you now have theater troops who have to engage with racism, not in terms of themselves as people, but their structural racism. How can we change the structure? You know that medicine is suddenly thinking, huh, we haven't carried out research into how symptoms impact black or brown skin. We've only ever done all of our research on white skin. You know what I mean? So, for example, in the U.S., for example, you can get a manual about this online, so really disturbing images of gross skin illnesses on white skin, black skin, and brown skin. Uh, if you look at it too long, you start developing rashes and breaking out in hives. But these are all things that we have to critically engage with, and it's a really good time now because we can't get around it. And there's all this sort of anti-wind, you know, who all say, oh, this is all identity literature. Sorry, literature is always about identities. That is the essence of literature. Let me tell you my story, and it's relevant. You know, but we have to see how far along we've come. You know, the first novel was Gracie, the Buddha of Suburbia. That was 1990. Before that, people like us only featured as tragic figures who committed suicide or went mad or died really early on, somehow or other. So we've made real progress, and there's a real backlash against it, too, it has to be said as well. I mean, I'm always very positive, and I think, oh, great, we're doing it. Backlash is a sign for our success. And, you know, Sadashati in the novel says that as well. The fact that I want to be you shows that you have become a cultural currency. It's no longer a clear hierarchy of up and down. It's much more complex. So, for example, resistance, revolution, that is not white coded, black is beautiful, and all of that. This is something we have because people work very hard to achieve it. We didn't just end up with it, you know, and all of this didn't happen for white people. And the next step in the debate would be to reflect on whiteness the way we reflect on masculinity which is also a kind of humanness. You know, whiteness was only defined in the context of white supremacy. Before that, there wasn't whiteness. It was just a sort of justification for the transatlantic slavism, uh, enslavement, or the white man's burden to civilize. We have to do that. We don't want to. There it is. But then whiteness became invisible because it was the norm. And now it's becoming visible. And now even whiteness can be changed in that context even venture to say that Black Lives Matter, to some degree, has set that kind of inquiry in motion. If you look at the crowds who are gathering on streets in the United States, they are very diverse crowds, interestingly enough. Uh, they are by no means, this is not uh, that black people are going onto the streets. Uh, people of many different colors are going onto the streets. And I think for many people in America, it has triggered uh, certainly deep reflection about what it means to be white. Um, but let me ask Amna a little bit about diversity politics, the politics of diversity and affirmative action, because your TED talk that we've mentioned a number of times is actually called Diversity Must Die. And you're clearly expressing ambivalence about making identity such a central part of our debate and what that sets in motion. Can you say a little bit about that and whether you are seeing a change? We just heard Me Too saying, yes, we're talking about things we didn't talk about before. Do you feel there's movement there? I do, yeah. Sometimes it's not moving as fast as I like, but it's always, change is always slow. But um, I remember having to move to London um, gosh, 10 years ago, because there was nothing in Scotland. No one knew what to do with 
a Scottish Pakistani funny woman that uh, they just didn't know what to do. So I had to kind of venture a bit um, out. And then in London, it was it was tricky in its own way. But the thing about diversity is that, and and, and this is with no disrespect because we're talking about it here, and trust me, I'm enjoying it immensely. It's um, it's just that. I would like to be asked about things that aren't just diversity, that aren't just about my ethnicity or my race. And we aren't at that point just yet. I feel like we are still in the mid of the conversation. And these things that we're talking about are brand new or at least not heard much for other people. But people like myself, we, I mean, we exist in this body. We, it, a conversation we've had over and over and over again, these experiences we've had. So it may be the first time someone's been introduced to it, but it is far from the first time that we've been talking about it. So sometimes for us, it can become a little bit tedious because we're answering questions we feel like we've answered a million times, only it's only now that people are listening. Um, so sometimes I feel like I myself can lose patience and then I have to remind myself that um, well that I shouldn't because it is amazing to see how far we've actually come and me too mentioned goodness gracious me and I love goodness gracious me I, I watched it rid- religiously and then um, Nina Wadia who was one of the stars in goodness gracious me ended up in my sitcom and that to me is this was like my one role model growing up and I somehow achieved in my own personal success of having this one role model that existed featured in my work and which was in it which was a really proud day but then I was like it was it was funny because I couldn't there wasn't that many people to choose from so it was just being reminded of how far we've come but also how far we have to how far we have to go um but then I think I've mentioned previously as well is that now that we are talking about diversity people assume a lot of things people assume I got an agent because Asians are in fashion now people assume I got my sitcom because they needed to fill a quota people assume that I I have any success at all and it all comes down to the fact that they think that um uh, that they are being denied something so that I can Mm -hmm. get it um, they never think that another white person has perhaps taken their spot or got what they wanted. It always has to be the person of colour. And it's it's never that they they don't even see me as talented or the 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 queries aren't about talent. Is she talented? It's always about um, oh, I bet like they got some diversity funding and that's why she's there. And that's really it's upsetting I mean I I have definitely gained thick skin but it's upsetting when you've worked so hard you've been ignored for so long and then all of a sudden someone is trying to tell you that you don't even deserve to be there when you actually have proven yourself so it's strange but again you need thick skin in the the writing industry anyway so that's kind of let, let it's me, a lesson. Let me jump in here because we don't have a lot of time left. And I'm sorry, you no. heard no, not at all. But you heard at the outset, uh, our, in the introductory greeting from Hartmut Dorgalo, uh, the head of the Humboldt Forum, his idea that these discussions will serve as a platform for debate about controversial, difficult, irritating topics. And I wonder if both of you could say a word about what you would hope to see this forum do. Also thinking back to Alexander von Humboldt himself and the figure that he was in the world of his time with an insatiable curiosity, with uh, a deep uh, desire to connect different parts of the world, uh, different uh, disciplines of thinking and schools of thought. Um, If you can both just say a brief word about your expectations or wishes or criticism of the Humboldt Forum, we'd be very interested. And I see Mitu's got her her microphone uh, poised and ready to go. So uh, bitte, Mitu, do zuerst and then Amna. Okay, Mitu, you first then, and then Amna. (laughs) 
Also natürlich in okay. erster Linie well, ist mein first Wunsch of all, und auch my wish ein bisschen die Bedingung dafür, dass wir erklären, dass wir noch mal mehrere Veranstaltungen miteinander machen. Und dass wir auch eine Serie von Veranstaltungen geben werden, dass die Benin-Bronzen zurückgegeben werden. Und dass wir auf eine ethnologische Sammlung, and auf eine ethnologische Sammlung gucken. Also eine ethnologische Collection, rather an ethnological connection. So it's unlogical. And so we have to critically engage with this collection. I was really afraid of today because I talked to lots of people. Should I do it? Shouldn't I do it? And then I decided I, I would do it. What Priya Basel said, you know, we have to come, we have to ask questions. But I'm between boycott and asking questions. And I sort of vacillated between the two. And I think it's really difficult. And I think the events that are being held are great. They're important. We have to get to the heart of the monster in this sense. But at the same time, the Humboldt Forum also has to prove that it means it seriously, that it's really doing it. And we can't just reconstruct a historical palace from the heyday of colonialism and keep all of these artifacts that were stolen and say, oh, but we can look after them better than where they're from. You know, it'd be terrible if we didn't have them. No, it's terrible that they aren't where they come from. From. You know, so it's difficult, not always difficult, but it, but it's a bit, I mean, it's pretty straightforward with the Benin bronzes, and that should be the first step, but it shouldn't be the last step. Amna? Um, I will be trying to be brief, but I just, I genuinely believe it's about as twee as the Therans that we all really, if we can all build each other up, then, um, and this becomes commonplace then I will truly be happy when these conversations become redundant and diversity isn't a topic that needs to be discussed as often because it is just so accepted and inbuilt into society and everyone is on a similar page where they don't feel fear for asking questions but they also don't feel fear for um for the change that is happening that they may be a bit more welcoming to it because at the end of the day it just means that there'll be more creativity to go around not less and surely that can't be a bad thing thank you so much um for both your thoughts on that amna maybe that's already a really hopeful outlook. Maybe we can invite you just to some closing sentences to this debate to share also the closing sentiment of that wonderful TED talk you gave and how you plan to be the change. Sure, so it all comes down to the fact that personally, when I learn more, I then share what I've learned and I, I internalize it because I realize I can affect change. I can be the change as cheesy as that sounds. It's frightening, but it's exciting. Um, but you know, the secret is, is that we all have the power and the power shared, the power that I may have, which is this very small amount, but still significant, it was shared to me from other people, people who amplified my work, people who didn't treat me as simply a color or a religion. Um, and I, I just think that all of us have that power. And going back to what I said, it's just, if we all build each other up, then one day these kind of conversations will be redundant and we'll have moved forward in discussing other issues. Um, and when you become a success as a minority, you become a role model, whether you want to or not. And it's a privileged position, but a lot of pressure. And everyone wants to know your secret. And you know, the secret is, and this is for everyone, it's you, you get knocked down, you cry, and then you get back up. And the other secret is luck. We all are given a certain amount of luck um, and we have to play with the cards that were dealt, but we can support each other in making sure we play the best we can. Well, I, I hope it's safe to speak for both of us when I say we feel extremely lucky that the two of you were the first guests for Gegenfragen. Ich möchte mich ganz, ganz herzlich bei dir, Mitu, und bei dir, Anna, und Anna, so much for coming on behalf of Melinda and myself. I'm so glad that you were our first guests for counter questions, and it was a wonderful conversation with you today. Thank you so much. And thank you that these two last messages that we've heard are ones that have helped us on our maiden voyage. It was it was a great maiden voyage with you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. It's been a pleasure.
And we also want to thank the organizers and by everyone who worked behind the scenes, also the interpreters in their very hot booths at the back of the room there, sweating away. We're very grateful to them as well, and we're very glad to be here. I'm sure I'll speak to my colleague too. And thank you too, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, thank you very much for your questions and comments. And Mitu and Amna, we very much hope that we will encounter you again over the course of the year live here in Berlin in the Humboldt Forum itself, hopefully. But first of all, we're going to continue in this format. And the next edition of Counter Questions will be on the 3rd of June. The guests and the issues will be announced on our newsletter and on our website, the Humboldt Forum. And the next event, next, the Humboldt Forum is Ascension Thursday, next week, 7 p.m., the second edition of the series, 99 Questions on Global Perspectives of Colonial Collections, which we referred to as well today. So it's following the trail, provenance research and object biographies and the filmmakers Nyokin Mumi and Jim Chuchu from the collective The Nest from Kenya will be discussing with one another, as well as Miranda Love from the Museum of Natural History in London and Alexis von Poser from the Ethnological Museum Berlin. We hope you will join us again then and that you will also join us for the next episode of Counter Questions. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye. Thank you for me too. And goodbye until the next time.